Sentry! Sentry! Where the, where's that sentry? Goma Pile, front and center! Out, who goes there? <laughs> Your instructions were never to leave your post. Oh, I didn't leave it, sir. I got it right here with me. <laughs> Come over here. On the double. Pile, behind that fence is the top secret hummingbird missile. It is rumored that there is an international spy in the area. Do you hear me, Pile? An international spy. Now, you watch for him and don't let him through. Yes, sir. That spy shows his face around here, and I'll grab onto him like a hound dog on a ham hog. <laughs> yes, you do that. Oh, boy. Foe! Who goes there? Friend or foe? Oh, it's nothing to worry about, G.I. Joe. No, don't please take it easy. I am a buddy, a pal. You see, I wouldn't hurt you for the whole world. I am a friend. Hold on now. You ain't no friend. Why not? Why do you say that? Cause she talk funny. <laughs> I talk funny? <laughs> I am a typical Yankee tourist on my vacation, me and the missus. We just came from a place where we had a double cheeseburger, and we had to order French fries, hold the mayo, and now we are going to a hoot nanny now. And Jimmy got corn, and I don't care. Everybody dancing at the bed. Yep, you're an American, all right. Yeah. I didn't recognize you at first with that New England accent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going to be a push over here. Tell me something, Dum Dum. Yes, sir, Mr. Yankee Tour. Hey, uh, what are you doing around here? I mean, what is your job, please? I'm in charge of guarding that hummingbird missile, the AZ-109 modified. Oh, please, here, just one minute. Would you talk into the wristwatch, please? Well, that's large, but why you want me to talk into your wristwatch? Well, because, you see, this is a watchy-talkie. <laughs> I see. Uh -huh. You want me to speak into this so you can make a recording of my voice yes. as a souvenir? Yes, you tell me all about the secret missiles here, yeah? Well, <clears throat> here's a song I had no, the pleasure of singing at the song. service. I don't want to hear about the song. This is, I want to hear about Ten the Ten things, no, please. turnip green. Can you tell me the military <laughs> secrets here? Just the military secrets. Ear of a sound, no, the tail of a cow. No, I, that's I, your man. Please, the military Steve. secrets I want Chicken to hear. Chicken feet. Would you tell me about the hummingbird missile? Oh, boy. Well, if you can't lick him, you got to join him there. The mountain stew, mountain stew, has a hot and good. But if they catch you, make a badger out of the neighborhood, for hood, for hood, for hood, for making mountain stew. From Television City in Hollywood, it's the Danny Kaye Show, with Danny's guest Jim Neighbors, the star of Gomer Pyle, and the Oscar Peterson Trio. Also featured tonight, Harvey Corman with Paul Weston and his orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, Danny Kaye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Good evening and welcome. Welcome to the show. We hope you have a pleasant time this evening. We, we have some marvelous guests with us tonight. And um, the first one, one of the brightest new names in television, the real Gomer Pyle, Jim Neighbors. Now, one of the great names in jazz, a man who has a way with a way out piano, Mr. Oscar Peterson. We're going to depart from our usual pattern on the show and present something with depth and substance. No offense. <laughs> Would you like me to leave, Paul? I think it might be for the best. <laughs> Our next guest is one of the world's great masters of the baton, and incidentally, my own personal idol, the great Viennese conductor Bruno Wilderhaven. <laughs> the name is Bruno Wilderhaven. <laughs> now, please. Please make him feel at home. It's really very important to me. Maestro, if you please. Ladies and 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is... Ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening, we would like to... Silence! <laughs> Good evening, music lovers, and welcome to the hall where beautiful music is made under the stars of the twinkling moon. <laughs> Tonight, we would like you to join me as we walk hand in hand down the path of music land. And I must explain to you, ladies and gentlemen, of the listening and watching audience, that my music has been my life ever since I was an infant. I, I was this big. <laughs> and I was what you call a child prodigy. <laughs> and you know, it's, uh, I was a child prodigy. Uh, I was a smart kid, but you know, that, that's what I was. Well, I composed my first composition at the age of eight months. No, really, think of this. Eight months. It was called Sonata for Nana and Gugu. <laughs> yes, it was scored for two flutes and a bassinet. <laughs> it was scored for two flutes and <laughs> one oboe player. <laughs> now, to get down to the basic fundamentals of, 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 the, of the music, <laughs> we must understand music. And how do we understand music? We learn about it. That's what we do. And first we learn to understand the basis of the whole musical instruments. Now, each instrument, as you will know, has its own easily recognizable characteristics. Now, for instance, this instrument here. You see, that is a saxophone. And this instrument here, which we have. Uh -huh. That is an xylophone. And that is the telephone. <laughs> Where did that come from? Now, the, the, the telephone is not playing today because it has the wrong number. <laughs> The orchestra, my friends, are divided into two families. First, we take the woodwind family. Now, um, first run is that, that we have it, which, which we have it there. The first one is the oboe, please. <laughs> now, the oboe player is an oboist. Now, then we have the bassoon. No, please, please. <laughs> watch your horn and watch my hand. <laughs> See, the bassoon player is a bassoonist. Now we have the clarinet. The clarinet player is a drunky. <laughs> Which brings us now to the brass, which are the tuba. I stopped at <laughs> No, no. <laughs> then we have the trombone. <laughs> Please, classical time. <laughs> now, the next one of the brass family is kind of the matriarch is called the trumpet. Now, the trumpet, my dear friends, can be played in three ways. Open. Nice, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have the same instrument played with a mutt, with a mute. Please. <laughs> and then played with a tissue. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the strings. And while the brass are blowing their brains out, these guys are just fiddling around. <laughs> right on Ed, all haben sie aber gehalten, das Krüppel wieder hölzen, Luftpause haben sie geflüchtet, und Stall 
Simon, help the knave with the high hunt, they say. <laughs> The strings consist of the violin, the viola, and the cello, which comes in six delicious flavors. <laughs> now, rounding out the whole ensemble, we have the percussion. Now, the percussion consists of the cymbals, and the timpanis, and the drums. And, of course, my friends, no orchestra would be complete without a triangle. And we have a beauty. <laughs> the drummer is in love with the piano player's wife. <laughs> the last but not least, who hides it? We have the man who leads the orchestra. And, I mean, with all due respect to me, he is the most important one because the way the conductor conducts, really, the same piece could sound altogether different. Let us take, for example, <laughs> the Beethoven's Fifth by Mozart. <laughs> Please. I will conduct the piece slowly, and then we will hear the same piece played fastly. Now, no, slow and fast. First, slow. Yes? I will give a silent downbeat to the orchestra. <laughs> now the same piece played fast, yes? <laughs> Gentlemen, it is hard to believe, really, that the piece can sound altogether different. You see, this is why a great conductor can bring life to a composer to interpret all the things. Now, for instance, <laughs> you see, Toscanini was a Beethoven expert, and Sir Thomas Beecham was a Mozart buff. <laughs> Myself, with all due respect, am the world's greatest living authority on the music from Franz Schubert. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> In particular, the music from Franz Schubert, the unfinished symphony. <laughs> now, you all know the famous, beautiful theme of this, yes? I, I forget the words here. <laughs> well, you see, ladies and gentlemen, this composition was never really completed, and tonight on this stage, with all due respect, I shall finish Schubert's unfinished symphony. <laughs> If you please, gentlemen. <laughs> please, no laughing doing the unfinished. <laughs> Schubert wrote this part. <laughs> After 140 years, in the year 1965, my finish to the unfinished symphony.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, very rare to receive the opportunity to introduce somebody who has no peer in their field. And in the field of jazz pianist, such a man is Oscar Peterson. And what's even more amazing than that, the two gentlemen who comprise the rest of the trio are stars in their own right, Ray Brown and Ed Thickpen. And we, with great, great delight, bring you Oscar Peterson and his trio.
My goodness. Oscar, thank you so very much. I hope you'll drop in and see us very soon again. It's really remarkable. In just a moment, my friends, Jim Neighbors has a wild surprise for you, and after that, Jim is going to join me in a sketch about one of your favorite TV westerns, so I hope you'll all stay put. Ladies and gentlemen, America's most beloved leatherneck, the man behind Gomer Pyle, Mr. Jim Neighbors. Say, James, an awful lot has happened to you since you were with us last year. Uh, at that time, if I remember correctly, you were running a gas station on the Andy Griffith show, weren't you? Yeah, that's right. Now I'm in the Marines. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Marines? The Marine Corps. <laughs> well, now, uh, Jim, um, did you, do you like the Marines better than you did the gas station? Well, the pay was better at the guy's station, but the Marines have got snappier uniforms. <laughs> you know, uh, Jim, I, I've, I've got to ask you something. I've been, I've been curious about this. You and Goma Pyle ha have such a marvelous affinity for each other. You seem to be, well, it, it, it's almost as though you were destined to play the part. Well, uh, I do like playing, Gomer, but all my previous training was in the classics. <laughs> classics? I, 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 I somehow, I just don't picture you in the classics somehow. I don't know why, Jim. Oh, yeah. I won an oratorical contest at Lucy Ledbetter High. I recited, How Do I Love Thee? by Elizabeth B. Browning. <laughs> How do I love thee? Let me count them ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. <laughs> Thank you, eyes put look. Well, it does something, Jim, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. I know you say that from the heart. Now, you know what my favorite poem is? Will James, I, I, I am not sure. I, I mean, in, in an honest you know, way of saying it. I, I am not really sure that poetry readings are really your style. Do you know it? That's exactly what Lerner and Lowe told me. <laughs> Lerner and Lowe? Uh-huh. When I tried out for my fair lady, you know, the part that Professor Higgins, the role that Rex Harrison took. <laughs> I didn't get the part. You didn't get the part? Well, I, I think I can understand that. It must have been because you're an American. Well, it couldn't have been that. I've well, done my British accent for him. <laughs> you uh, do a British accent? Uh-huh. You ready? Uh, just let me get squared away here. <clears throat> ready. Right toe, Governor. <laughs> Why can't the English teach their children how to speak? Well, this verbal place distinction should now be antique. If you spoke as she does, sir, instead of the way you do, why, you might be selling flowers, too. It's a wonder Rex Harrison can sleep nights. <laughs> Jim, for just a minute, I'd like to see, speak to you seriously. May I? All right. What's on your mind? Well, I, I just think that the audience would like to know that the real Jim Neighbors is actually a very versatile actor. And uh, he has a marvelous singing voice. You do singing, don't you? Yeah, when I was in my teens, I w wanted to be on the musical stage. Well, James, this is your musical stage. Ladies and gentlemen, the really fine voice of Jim Neighbors. I've been away from you a long time. I never thought I'd miss you so. Singing it his song time, the banjo strumming soft and low. I know that you yearn for me to Swanee, you're calling me Swanee, how I love you.
love you, how I love you, my dear old Swanee. I'd give the world to be among the folks in PIX, even though my man is waiting for me, praying for me, down by the Swanee. The folks up north will see me no more when I get to that Swanee shore. Swanee, Swanee, I'm coming home to Swanee, Mammy, Mammy, I love the old folks at home. Stay tuned as we present one of TV's favorite westerns. Get on your horse and clippity clop. Ride for the boss till you take a flop. That's the end of the very first stanza. Bullets flying day and night. Cowboys dying left and right with a shot in the La Bonza. La Bonza. The Bonzo, the Bonzo. I tell you, I've had it. I've had it right up to here. Now, for three days now, you've been having a burr under your saddle. Tell me, what's eating on you, Brother Ox? <laughs> I'll tell you what's eating on me, little Mo. It's Fat Daddy. <laughs> but he's so worried about them sheep farmers, he has us out stringing wire, putting up new fences, guarding the boundary all night, whilst our delicate, sensitive brother, Rubes Pierre, we don't do nothing but go around collecting butterflies all day. Ooh, ooh, I'd like to put a bullet right through his copy of Winner the Pooh. <laughs> now simmer down. Put up your gun. <laughs> Why don't you have a talk with your brother? Well, I can't very well do that now. He's on a killer crick taking his bubble bath. <laughs> Hey, little Mo. Hi, big ox. Me and your brother, brother Robespierre. <laughs> Thought you was out taking your bubble bath. Well, I was going to, but on the way down there, I found this yellow-winged, purple-tailed Epidopterus. That's a butterfly, you know. <laughs> Did you catch it? No, I couldn't. It beat me up. You know them butterflies is skinny, but they know karate. <laughs> A big surprise for him. Where is he? Women. I think I think I hear Fat Daddy coming now. <laughs> oh, I just gotta lose some weight. My horse just exploded. 
Morning, Fat Daddy. Morning, son. Uh, morning, Fat Daddy. Morning, son. Morning, Slam. Love that boy. <laughs> Rokespierre, come on here a little closer. I think I'm going to try and kiss you again. All right, Daddy, but don't muss up my hair. Well, don't worry about so much about your hair. Old Fat Daddy wants to give you a kiss. Yeah, just here. Uh... Now, come on here. <laughs> little more ox. Why are you stand there? You know what to do. Come on here and get along here and do it now. <laughs> now, easy now. Don't drop him like you did the last time. His brain can't stand much more pounding, you know. Listen, Daddy, I got a surprise for you. Have you now, son? Yes, sir. Well, I want it. Just a minute. Hey, what you boys doing here? Huh? Go on, get back to work. Little Mo, you go down to the North 40 and round up some stairs, and you go to the corral and break some wild horses, you hear? Go on now, don't be standing there around here like that. New ropes, Pierre, you crochet. <laughs> you crochet me a new doily. <laughs> Daddy, you're the most. I'm going to name a butterfly in your honor. Listen, Fat hey, Daddy. Daddy. How come we all the time got to do all the dirty work around here while this weakling sits around here all day and sews? Well, it ain't all that easy. Needle points hard on your eyes. <laughs> and you come with us. <laughs> I'm telling you once, and that's all I'm telling you, you hear? I'm just going to tell you one more time. Don't you ever lay a grubby finger on that boy, you hear? Don't you ever do that. Now, you want to know why I don't send him out with you, son? Yeah, yeah, Fat Daddy. I don't send him out because that boy's the only link with the culture and education this family's got. Now, go on and get out of here. <laughs> son, would you say one of them fine words for me? Oh, Daddy, do I have to? Oh, come on, do it for me now, son. Well, all right. Perspicacity. Oh, my. <laughs> T-E-R-S-P-I-C-A-C-I-T-Y. Oh, ain't that the most beautiful thing you ever heard in your life? Hey, you want me to use it in a cinema? No, no, don't do that, son. No, there's just so much excitement a man can stand. <laughs> now, can I tell you my surprise? Hey, Daddy, I see? tell you, I just don't like it. Me and little Mo, you treat us like we're black sheep. Sheep? Don't you ever... Don't you ever mention she sheep, did you see? No, help me up here, son. Don't you ever say sheep in front of me again. I didn't mean nothing, Pa. Now, I don't know what you meant. Now, listen, you two. This is my ranch, you hear? The Ruby Rosa. <laughs> this is cattle country. You hear that? Cattle country. And I never want to hear the sheep around here again. I want no sheep coming in here eating up my grazing grass. Do you hear that? you hear what I said? I just don't want no sheep coming in here and eating my grazing grass. Now, don't you say nothing. I ain't finished talking yet. Huh? If you go to sleep at night, you better not be counting any sheep. Do you hear that? You just better not be counting any sheep. You just better count chickens. That's what you better do. You better count chickens, you hear? Now, get out, both of them. Hey, you! Come here! Don't you leave there without kissing your daddy goodbye. Yes, that daddy. <laughs> Sheep, I can't stand sheep, Robespierre. I just can't stand sheep. Sheep, I hate sheep. I hate them. I want nothing to do with sheep. I just, I want nothing, nothing to do with sheep at all. I just, I, I can't get one of them cruel ones here. Just, oh, just stand back here, son. Let me lean up against you. There we are. Now, son, what was that surprise you said you had for me? Well, I'm marrying the sheep rancher's daughter. <laughs> you what? Well, well, she's beautiful, Daddy. She don't look nothing well, like no sheep. Uh, well, maybe no a little bit around the hair. No son of mine is marrying any sheep rancher's daughter. Did you hear what I said? Daddy, say? I'll say one of them big words no, for you. It, it ain't this is this, Daddy. Persicasty. That nah, ain't gonna do you no good, son. You big with it. No, it ain't gonna help. No. Supercalifragilistic expialidocious. How's that, Greg? <laughs> said that, son. Oh, that's beautiful. That ain't a word, son. That's a symphony. Sit down here, son. Sit down. And use it in a sentence for me, will you, for your old dad? <coughs> okay, here goes. My daddy wanted me to use a big word in a sentence, so I used supercalifragilistic expialidocious. Oh, boy, that's good, you know. Son. <coughs> son. 
You know, ever since your mother died, I've been both mother and father to you. That's why I weigh 600 pounds. <laughs> Son, why'd you do it? Why'd you do it, son? Why did you have to go and take up with a lady of the sheep persuasion? <laughs> Listen to me, Fat Daddy. You'll have to face up to it. You can't keep sheep out of the West no more than you can keep the cows out. This is a big country, and the air has got to be filled with the sounds of not only moo-moo, but bad-ass whale. And the world will be a better place when the moo-moos and the bad-ass can live together. <laughs> the moo moos and the babas, huh, son? Son, in your honor, I'm donating a suite of rubber rooms at the Nevada home for the La La. <laughs> Now, you ain't marrying her, do you hear that, boy? Help me up here. You ain't marrying her, I still own this ranch, and nobody's going to tell well, me... Won't you just meet her, please, Daddy? No, I don't want to meet her. I want nothing to do with her. Please, I... you might like her. I won't like her at all. Come in here, please. Now, I ain't going to do you no good, son. Just get out of here, and you ain't going to marry no sheep rancher's daughter. Because I'll tell you one... I, you, you, you ain't going to marry a sheep ran, a sheep uh, dad, dad, ran. You're not going to marry a sheep daddy's rancher. A ranch daddy's daddy, sheep, <laughs> sheep daddy's rancher. Mm, boy, son, that's even better than perspicacity. Supercalogistifalgilasticiosis, you know? That's your girl, son? Heck no, Daddy. That's her poor, withered mama. Oh. This here's my girl. Come in here, Bo Peep. I want to tell you something, son. If I... <laughs> my son... There's more of that brain that's working than we know. <laughs> Can I marry up with her daddy, huh? Can yeah, I? might even be a double wedding, son. <laughs> Far be it from me to keep a bye-bye from a cuckoo. <laughs> You have some streamers up in your house? What for? For my cat. You have streamers up in your house for your cat? What's, what's the matter with your cat? It's his birthday. <laughs> well, how old is he? Seven. He's seven? Is he a she or a fee cat? A he. A he cat? <laughs> what's his name? Tuffy. Tuffy? And aren't you going to bring him down one day to visit me? Remember you said you were going to bring him down because he's a nice cat and we'll have lunch together, huh? <laughs> me and the cat and I. And we'll get some, we'll get some, oh, Victoria. What did you feed him the other night? Remember when you got up from your nap and you went up and you fed the cat? What did you give him to eat? Dog food. <laughs> Did he like it? He did? You know the joke that we were, you were going to tell me when you came out today? Somebody's asleep here. <laughs> nice and loud, maybe we'll wake him up. <laughs> okay. What's the joke? What's a booby bird? What's a booby bird? I don't know. A bird that sticks his head into a beehive and says, Booby. <laughs> a bird that sticks his head into a beehive and says, Booby. That's normal. You know what I heard? You know what? You know what? What? I heard you learned a new song. 
did you? Huh? You know the one about the reluctant dragon? Well, would you sing the song for me and for the nice people who are watching you tonight? You will? Okay. One fine day while on my way to Ipswich by the sea, I met a rather charming chap who asked me into tea. It seems he was a dragon, one of those awful things with teeth and tails and claws and scales and all those dragon-like details. I am mad I jumped a bit when he began to sing. Oh, I'm the reluctant dragon. What ho, quite so. A very reluctant dragon. Oh, very, very, don't you know? They call me the timid dragon. What rot, I'm not. I just won't fight, I'd rather play. I know I shan't get hurt that way. Here we go gathering nuts in May. We are militant. <laughs> <laughs> And you are beautiful. And I hope I will see you very, very soon. Okay? Now you want to take my two fingers and we'll get down like we usually do. Bye bye, Vicky. Now, do you, do you remember that I promised that I was going to introduce you to, uh, to three lovely ladies? Well, they are three very young, very lovely, very lady ladies. And the reason we'd like you to meet them is because we have heard from you, and um, in your letters you have mentioned that you'd like to know who the girls are who dance on the show. And so we decided that we were going to present them to you, and we were going to do it in a kind of a song form, and then you would get to know them a lot better than you do now. Paul? May I introduce Jackie, Elaine, and Nancy Talented, young, and fancy These are the dancing ladies on our show Pert and pretty Jackie is disarming Every little movement that she makes is charming Nancy, Elaine, and Jackie Making the public wacky Setting the sets across the land aglow Nancy is a talent and a beauty A cutie you simply have to know And the fair Elaine I can't explain Her matchless grace and style Oh, the slides and twirls of these lovely girls I dance about a mile in fifth position Jackie, Elaine, and Nancy Making the world romancy Driving the whole establishment insane May I introduce this lovely trio Of Jackie and Nancy and Elaine
fifth position. Jackie, Elaine, and Nancy, feminine, and fine, and dancy. Nobody in the world could make a choice. And I'm very happy I can dance with Miss Gregory, Miss Martin, Miss John. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for spending this hour with us, and our thanks to Jim Neighbors, Oscar Peterson, the splendidly serious Harvey Corman, <laughs> Jimmy Lanfear, and our own Victoria Myring. Now, a few weeks ago, the Ranger space probe took 7,000 pictures of the surface of the moon. And the pictures were taken on a Saturday afternoon, but they weren't released until the following Monday, and many many people wondered why it took so long for the pictures to be developed. Well, the answer is very simple, really. The drugstore was closed on Sunday. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>